two stories for you this evening, loosely on the theme of being trapped in an isolated room for much longer than you'd choose to be, both with similar, although not identical, outcomes. And in the first of them, I'm delighted to introduce the wonderful, the marvellous Mr. X Dreams, who is making a fantastic guest performance here. Now, if you're not familiar with this channel, please, after you've listened to the stories, go and check him out. He consistently delivers the highest quality storytelling on YouTube, in my opinion. Well, my dear friends, it's time once again to sit back and relax with your favourite drink, and listen. I've been locked alone in here for over a year. Until today, that is. I'm not locked in here against my will. Oh no, I lock myself in here. But where is here exactly? Here is a bunker that I had constructed over the past ten years. I started it back in 52 and finished it just before those damn commies put those missiles in Cuba. After that happened, I knew I had to save myself before something terrible happened. So I grabbed all that I could and locked myself underground. I know that they launched those missiles, because I haven't heard any sort of movement outside of here in months. Ever since then, I've been in here, waiting and waiting, until it's safe to return to the surface. My bunker sits 100 feet underground. Only one way out. Through a hatch in the top and through a long tunnel with only a ladder inside. And I've been alone this entire time. Until now. Just last night, someone came knocking on the hatch. I ignored it at first. Thought I was hearing things because well, it's so far away. But they haven't let up now for three days. Every morning he comes back and starts back up again. I've been listening to that wretched banging for three whole days. I wasn't going to open it because I knew that well, if I let someone else in, I wouldn't have enough supplies to go around for more than one. But I felt bad that someone might actually be alive out there and needs my help. But I can't stand that noise anymore. Oh, it's been relentless. He must have been yelling too, because sometimes it'll start for ten seconds or so, and then start all over again. Finally, when I couldn't last any longer, and I felt like my head was going to explode, I cracked. I made the ascent up to the hatch and listened closely. The man was yelling to let him in, in between the banging. I couldn't help but feel pity for the man. And some caution, because well, he might just have been out to take the things that I'd worked so hard to achieve. And then I thought about how lonely I've been, how long I've gone without human contact, and, well, I couldn't resist it any longer. I gave in to temptation and yelled back at the man. I yelled to the man that I was going to open the hatch and to move back. I turned the wheel and threw the heavy door open to see a man standing in the dirt next to the opening, his fist bloodied and broken from the constant banging. He wasn't a very physically imposing man, but not a small man to be sure. I eyed him with suspicion, but he looked so relieved that I'd opened the door that I couldn't help but feel like I'd done something good. Hmm. How do you survive out here so long? I inquired, still eyeing the man, my body half in the ground, half out. What do you mean? There's no danger out here. He responded, a little confused. What do you mean? Those missiles in Cuba are still there. War hasn't broken out yet. I asked, confused, because if the bombs hadn't been dropped, why had the noise of traffic stopped months ago? Why had the radio signals been dead? Why was it always so quiet? 
Oh no, there's a war. But it doesn't involve the bombs. The Northeast has been evacuated, and I came back to look for some things I left out here. He said, gesturing towards a group of cabins nearby. Hmm, I'm assuming you didn't find what you were looking for, I said, looking at his empty hands. No, nobody was there. I was headed back when I found the plans to your little shelter in the basement of one of the cabins, and I came only to find it locked. Why do you want to get in? If there's no bombs, then what's the point of coming down here? I asked, leaning closer. Can we talk about this inside? I don't think it's safe out here. Okay. I'll get down first so I can keep an eye on you, I said. Turn the wheel to close the hatch when you enter. The man entered, and I descended the rungs of the ladder until I reached the very bottom, keeping my eyes on him the whole time. I opened the door when I reached the bottom, and stepped into my shelter. The stranger was right behind me, and he closed the door as he walked in, and then sat down on one of the chairs in the kitchen. I sat across from him, and we both sat in silence for a moment. Then I asked him once again. So, what's about to happen? I asked, looking at the stranger. You really don't know. The Soviets are invading. And if they lose the invasion, then the bombs are going off, no doubt. They're invading? I repeated, shocked. That's what the government says anyway and they've evacuated the entire south and northwest. They haven't got here yet? I asked inquisitively. I don't think they're really invading. I haven't heard so much as a peep since coming out here. Not even our own military out here. I think they called the invasion off, or we beat them and our government hasn't told us yet. They're always lying. And why would the Soviets invade if they have rockets? They would lose too many men to an invasion. It's not worth it to them, but better safe than sorry, am I right? He said, with a wide grin on his face. I knew I needed to get in soon, and who would have known it's been occupied? Do you have any communication with the outside world down here? Radio's been silent for months. I don't even have it on anymore, I said, still letting the stranger's story sink in. Well, there's not much here so I don't need to give you the grand tour. Now that we're splitting rations, I only have food for a few more months at the most. After that, well, we'll deal with that when it comes along, I explained to the man, both of us still sitting in the kitchen chairs. We don't need to wait that long. We can leave here sooner once we know for sure that there's no invasion, the man said, matter-of-factly. We both continued sitting there, the man letting the new atmosphere of the place sink in. In my mind, I was glad that someone else was here with me, but I couldn't help but feel slightly suspicious of the newcomer. I hadn't spoken to another soul in months, so I just shrugged it off as anxiety from a change in my routine. We continued with the routine of living underground for the next couple months. We rarely talked, and just sat around doing pointless tasks to pass the time. But every time we did talk, he always brought up the possibility that it was a false alarm, and that the surface was clear. But I wasn't about to risk everything I'd worked for to be destroyed by a chance that it was safe. When he wasn't talking about the surface being safe, he'd be talking about all of the government's lies and how they'd been manipulative. <sighs> It was really starting to get to me. And he ate more food than I did. But I never complained. I just acted like I didn't notice. But my resentment for him slowly grew. If he kept this up, we'd be out of supplies in a matter of weeks. Now I avoided talking to him because he would always return to the topic of the surface. Chances were... If we returned to the surface, we'd be met with a nuclear wasteland, or staring down the barrels of Soviet rifles. 
every time he said we should return, I dismissed him. He brought it up again later, and again, and again. Finally, I snapped, and we got into an argument about the whole thing. The solitude was starting to get to me, and I let it all out on him. I'd been alone with that man for four months now. Now, we just go about our routine. Some days, speaking nothing at all. And the silence, the silence, it's the kind of silence that you can hear. It sounds like nothing, yet it makes the loudest noise. I can't take it anymore. I need a change. I'll be damned if he ruins everything for me. Nothing ever changes down here. Even our daily conversation. He still brings out the topic of returning to the surface. I feel like he's trying to get rid of me. Trying to steal everything that I've got for himself. That's why he's talking about the surface so much. That's why he's always going on about it. He's out to get me, because he wants it all to himself. And the other day, we really got into it. We were in the living room, and he tried to bring it up again, and I responded with a smart retort. If you believe all the shit you say, then why the hell are you still here? I asked him in an aggressive tone. Because I don't want to go out there alone. Why don't you come with me? He asked. The hell I am. There's no telling what could be up there. I sure don't want to be up there with you. I yelled in response. What the hell is that supposed to mean? If that's the case, why are you down here with me? He asked, standing up and stepping towards me. What? You're the one who's down here with me. This is my place, and all you've done is take advantage of my hospitality. You won't shut the fuck up about all the lies and cover-ups done by the government. You actually believe that bullshit. You're gonna get us both killed if you keep trying to leave. Oh, and you're some gracious host, then? If you didn't want me down here, then why would you let me in in the first place? We're gonna have to leave sometime, and you know it. When that day comes, you won't turn my offer down, he said as he stormed out of the living room and into the bunk room. Now I know he's trying to lure me out. He hasn't even made an author other than to come up with him. I don't know what that whack job has planned, but I'm not falling for his shit. I'm not going to let him leave and endanger both of us. I should never have let him in in the first place. I regret it every day. Every night, I don't sleep out of fear that he's going to try something. Now I see signs of him planning it everywhere. He sounds suspicious. Every time I see him, he looks suspicious. Oh, how I would love to get rid of this parasite and have my place all to myself once again. I can see it now. Oh, things back to the way they used to be. The peace and quiet I once despised, I now long for more than anything. At this moment in time, there wasn't very much I wouldn't do to fulfill that desire. The next day, we ran out of food. He lost it again. We got into another argument and he stormed off even angrier than the last time. And once again, my resentment grew to full-blown hate. Everything that was wrong, I found a way in my mind to pin it on him. Maybe it was being confined in this space for the better part of a year, or how little I communicate with the only other inhabitant, but, well, I started to get restless. He gives me weird looks now, and we haven't spoken since the argument. He's going to do it soon. Because of the food problem. He's getting desperate. And so now, I wait for him to make his move. I will make him regret it. Oh, I can't wait for it to happen. Finally, an excuse to rid myself of this freeloader. 
the night following the day we ran out of supplies. I sat in bed thinking about this man's story. If the Soviets were invading, then why didn't he just walk back to our lines and get back to civilization? It didn't add up. He was hiding something. A reason for why he didn't want to go back to the rest of the country. But he didn't want to stay underground. Every day my trust for the man wanes more and more. I started keeping a knife on me wherever I went. I was afraid that he'd try something so that he could leave. Whenever he was asleep, I would quietly sharpen the blade, telling myself how I can't wait to use it on the bastard. I could imagine plunging it into him and hearing the quiet once again. Oh, the piercing noise of silence. Every day, I fought the temptation to use it on him. Oh, how hard it was to resist the urge. But I knew the day would come. Soon, soon I can enjoy the silence again. The next night, he snuck out of bed and tried to make a break for it. I was ready for him, though. I knew this was going to happen tonight, so I stayed up and waited for him to try it. He left the room and made a break towards the door to the ladder. I jumped out of bed, grabbed the knife out of my pillowcase, and ran after him. He had to slow down to open the door, and even though the room was twenty feet across, I closed the distance between us in no time at all and tackled the man from behind. Get the hell off me, I'm getting out of here, he yelled, trying to throw me off of him. You don't know what you're doing, you're gonna kill us both. I yelled as I pinned him down and stabbed the knife downwards in an arc towards his chest. He saw the blade and tried to roll to the side, and the blade caught him. The knife was lodged in between his ribs, so I resorted to my fist and started throwing punches towards his face. One punch landed squarely on his nose, and I felt it crack beneath my hand. Hot blood squirted all over my fist and his face. He yelled, turned over, and kicked me off. He lunged for the ladder and tried to make his way up, yelling in pain from the knife lodged in his side. I climbed on the ladder as well and tried to grab his leg, but he kicked down and landed a hit squarely in my forehead. He kept going, and I kept following. He made it to the top. I was right below him. As he diverted his attention to the hatch, I reached up and grabbed his feet and pulled them from the rungs that were slippery from his blood. He let out a cry as he lost his balance and fell backwards down the shaft of the tunnel and plummeted towards the bottom. I heard him hit the sides on the way down and he landed with a sickening crunch at the bottom of the ladder. I climbed down, making sure not to slip on the man's blood, which now stained the walls of the space as well. I reached the bottom of the ladder and saw the man's lifeless body, bent and broken, laying in a heap at the bottom of the ladder. He was dead. Come to think of it, I never even knew his name. I had to do it, though. He would have killed me, but now that he was gone, the silence was back. Oh, the dreaded silence. So loud and so quiet all at once. I walked into the living room and reclined in a chair. And just listened. I swear, I heard the sound of cars. Not just cars, but the sound of people too. I must have been hallucinating. There was no way. I listened harder, straining myself to hear. And sure enough, there it was. The sound of people talking. I followed the sound back up the ladder, slippery with blood, all the way to the base of the hatch. 
The voices were louder now. It sounded like someone was yelling. I grabbed the hatch and turned it, throwing open the heavy door once again. Outside, it was bright and sunny, and nearby the highway was littered with cars, and two people arguing over a flat tire on the side of the road. <laughs> he was right. He was an honest man who hadn't lied to me. <laughs> His theories were right, and I'd killed him for it. And I'd enjoyed what I'd done. Because now, I once again live in relative peace and quiet. Everything was blurry and white, like as if I'd had a bright light shining on my face. I could hear muffled voices too. They sounded as if they were in a panic. Finally. The blurriness started to fade away, and the voices started to become clear. Hey, hey, can you hear me? You okay? Can you hear us? I remember feeling strange, like after you wake up from a long nap in the middle of the day, but I also felt uncomfortable at the same time. I felt sore, like I hadn't moved for a long time. I sat up slowly and looked around. I noticed three people. The first guy I saw was wearing a white dress shirt with black pants, a tie, and black shoes. A woman next to him was wearing pajamas. A black shirt of a picture of a band I'd never heard of, pajama pants and sneakers. The last guy next to her was a young looking guy wearing a dark blue jumpsuit. What's going on? Where am I? We've been wondering the same thing said the guy in the dress shirt. When, when did you guys get up? Not long before you. About a couple minutes, said the woman nervously. The room was big, or at least seemed big because there was really nothing in it. It wasn't tall, but the ceiling seemed to be as tall as a normal house ceiling, and the room itself just seemed to be as big as well, a normal room. There were three outlines behind me of what looked like doors, like as if they were meant to be pushed or slid upwards like a garage door. At the time, I thought they were entrances, but why three doors? I thought that it couldn't be for each of us at the time since, well, there were four of us. The walls had weird scuff marks that made it look like something heavy had slid across the walls. All I thought at the time was how strange it was. I got up and looked around. I noticed something else strange. There were these black orbs indented in the walls, all except for the one behind me. Right above the orb on the front wall was a rectangular thing. It was black and looked to be made of the same material as the orbs. The guy in the jumpsuit walked up to me. They're cameras. What? They're cameras. Those things on the walls. I mean... What else could those things be? I see them at work all the time, except they're not indented into walls, they're usually on the corners of ceilings. Well, why the hell are they inside the walls? That doesn't make any sense. Oh, and what's that thing above it? Honestly, man, I don't know. Another camera, maybe. Who knows? I mean, what even is this place? How do we even get here? I mean... The last thing I remember is just mopping the floors, and then, well, I'm here. The guy in the white shirt then said, well, I was just sitting at my desk. I remember feeling really tired, though, like I hadn't slept in days. Me too, said the girl. I remember getting out of bed and heading over to my car to pick up some drive through breakfast. All of a sudden, I just felt extremely tired. Then, well, I woke up here. Once she was finished, everyone looked straight at me. I felt uneasy. I explained that I was just washing the dishes at my house, and that I too remember having this great tiredness. I told them that the last thing I heard was some dishes crashing into the floor. Once I'd finished talking, 
the guy in the button-up headed towards the outline of the doors. At first, he tried feeling them. He then tried pushing and kicking at the doors. Of course, nothing happened. I then went up to the doors and asked the guy in the jumpsuit to come over as well. I then said, All right, on three, we all push each of the doors at the same time. One, two, three. We all pushed on the doors at the same time. Nothing happened. Oh, you gotta be kidding me, said the guy in the jumpsuit. The guy in the dress shirt then said, All right, let's think. What's our goal here? To get the doors open, said the guy in the jumpsuit. No, of course that's the point. I mean, why we'll get the door open. We know that we're surrounded by cameras. There's four of us and only three doors. I then said, What's that supposed to mean? The guy in the dress shirt then shot a look at me. He looked more serious than before. Look, three guys, one girl, in a locked room. My heart started pounding, and the guy in the jumpsuit showed a clear look of fear and disgust. I looked over at the girl in the pajamas, and she looked like she was about to cry. Hold on, she says. If any of you so much as lay a finger on me, I swear... I'm just thinking out loud, okay? Well, that's the weird thing about thinking out loud, said the guy in the jumpsuit. Well, what do you think we're supposed to do? I don't know, man. Just not that. As soon as he said that, there was a loud sound that seemed as if it came from some industrial machine. The rectangular thing on the top of the camera then lit up and letters formed on the small device. It said, Only three. The walls on the left and right started closing in. Then the three doors opened up. The doors weren't entrances. They were pods that were meant to protect us from the walls while they were closing. Everything started to make sense and a feeling of dread came upon me. He was right, said the guy in the jumpsuit. I looked at the guy in the dress shirt and I saw him immediately kick the woman. The guy in the jumpsuit ran towards the dress shirt guy and punched him in the face, knocking him down. I helped the girl up, then looked over at the jumpsuit guy. He'd been knocked down by the other guy. The dress shirt guy then started wailing on him. I ran over and tackled the dress shirt guy. I got on top of him, trapped his arms with my legs, and started punching him in the face till my hands hurt. Once he looked like he couldn't do anything else, I got up and sprinted toward the middle door. The jumpsuit guy got in the door to the right of me. When we'd all gotten into the doors, or pods, a clear glass door formed in front of me. Since I was in the middle, I got to see. I got to see a man pound on the glass door and plea for me to help him. Watching him turn into nothing. Hearing his bones crack and break, and that put an indescribable feeling in me that I don't think I'll ever be able to explain. And that was the last thing I remember. They must have knocked me out again. Yeah, I know. Well, if you're wondering why I'm writing this, well, I don't know who to talk to. If I tell someone I know, they could get hurt. If I tell this to a bunch of strangers, well, you won't get hurt. I mean, who's going to believe some guy on Reddit talking about a torture chamber, right? Go on, admit it. You were secretly hoping it'd be the dress suit man who got killed in the second one, weren't you? Yes, you were. Well, I was. <laughs> Strange, isn't it? I don't know why, but there you go. Well, thanks again to Mr. Extremes for his fantastic guest performance in that first story. 
Like I said, please go and check out his channel. Really is some of the highest quality storytelling you will find anywhere on YouTube. Much better than me. Hi, Mr. Kitten. What do you want? Okay, gotta go. The cat wants feeding. Till next time, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay?